You know, every year, the, in the beginning of the year, I always kind of try and circle back to uh, focus our time looking at our vision statement of the church. What is the, the vision? Why do we exist as a church? How are we going forward when there's a lack of clarity as to who we are and where we're going? Um, it kind of creates a little bit of a blur uh, amongst the congregation as to who are we and where are we going? I remember learning in seminary that what's a, what's a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. Right? And so we want to make sure that we are uh, intentionally kind of circling back and focusing our uh, attention on our, our mission, our vision, and our values um, here at the church. And today we're going to look at that, um, looking at that through the lens of Isaiah's um, vision that he has in Isaiah chapter 6. If you have your Bibles with you or you can look at the screen above me, we'll be looking at that. Um, you know, the thing that drives the direction of every church, in fact, every organization, uh, is really its mission, its vision, and its values, right? If, if, it, if a mission, if an organization doesn't have a mission, a vision, and, in val and values, it's not going to get anywhere. It's not going to be moving in a direction, and it's not going to have clarity uh, amongst the people who are a part of that. And so this morning, uh, we're going to take a look at our mission, our vision, and our values. And, and specifically, when we talk about our mission, what is our mission? Well, our mission is ultimately very clear because we didn't come up with our mission. Um, this isn't our church. This is God's church. And Jesus gave every Bible-preaching church the same mission, right? It's the, what is the mission of Jesus' church? It is to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, Right? This is what Jesus gave the church to do as he, was ascended in, as, as he was ascending into heaven. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We don't need to get super creative on what our mission is because it's not our church. It's Jesus' church. And Jesus has already laid out for us what the mission of the church is. We are to go and we are to make disciples, right? We are to observe all the things that Jesus has taught and commanded us. Our mission defines why we have a church. Our vision lays out how we go about fulfilling the mission that Jesus gives us. How do we see Integrity Church fulfilling the mission that Jesus has given to us? And then our values, the things that we hold dear, right? Those things that, that drive the decisions and the priorities of our church. We're going to look at that uh, a little, at, at, on a different time. But this morning, I want to kind of focus more primarily on our vision, um, and um, as we look at our vision, I want to remind you that our vision statement is the same vision statement that we rolled out when we started the church 17 years ago. It hasn't changed one bit. Uh, we've introduced different dynamics along the way, but our mission statement has always been reaching up, reaching out, and reaching in. Integrity Church se seeks to be a church that is reaching up in dynamic and passionate worship to God. We seek to be a church that is reaching out to the unchurched with the message of hope that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And then we seek to be a church that is reaching in through intentional discipleship and the study of God's word. Reaching up, reaching out, and reaching in. These are priorities that we see woven all throughout the scriptures. Obviously, from Genesis to Revelation, we always see God working in his people to get them reaching up, reaching out, and reaching in. This morning, we're going to take a look at that through the lens of Isaiah's vision that he has in Isaiah chapter 6. And so if you have your Bibles, let's take a look at that together. Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died... Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. It's a great way to open up a chapter. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Chapter 6 opens up with the context of what's happening in the life of Isaiah, but in fact, the, all of the people of Israel at the time. It's a very significant time for Israel because they are entering into a season of change. He highlights and says, it's in the year that King Uzziah died. He said, I saw the Lord. We learn about King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Who is, who is this king? 
King Uzziah became king when he was 16 years old. Imagine that. 16 years old, he became king, and and he reigned in Jerusalem for, for 52 years. He had a long stint as being a king. He was a king who was known for doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Not all the kings of Israel had that testimony. In fact, his grandson really crashed and burned. Um, but, but for, for Uzziah, um, Isaiah was known for being one who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, as, as it says, as long as he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now, there was a season in his life that was not um, very stellar. He actually had a very successful 50 plus years as, as a king. But as he neared the end of his life, uh, he actually took a bit of a, he didn't finish very well. Um, king Uzziah, with his, popula- with his popularity growing, his successes, right? In the midst, in the midst of all of his growing acceptance, um, he's with a group of people and they decide that he is going to burn incense on the altar in the temple. That doesn't sound like a really big deal. But the reality of it is, it was forbidden for anybody but a priest to burn incense on the altar. And as a result of that, God judged him. Matter of fact, God struck him with leprosy. And and, and for for a time, he kind of was put aside, and his his son Jotham kind of governed in his place um, until the time of his death. And so he had a stellar time as being a king. He didn't finish really well towards the end, but, but the successes of his kingship had already affected Israel. They were already walking in the midst of, of tremendous blessing as a result of his rulership. We see that during his reign, he was a man who sought after God. He led armies to victories. He, 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 he defeated the Philistines and the Arabians and the Mayanites. He built walls of protection for his people against the engaging enemy. His fame was spread all throughout Egypt. He was known as a very strong king. He built towers, he dug wells, he had much livestock. He loved the soil and he taught his people how to farm so that they would never be in want. The people of God flourished under the rulership of this king. He established powerful and enormous armies, and and he taught them how to fight, always coming home victorious. Under the reign of Uzziah, the southern kingdom was prospering tremendously. They had food, they had shelter, they had security, and they had the notoriety and the respect from other nations. In the midst of all of this, the, uh, the ministry of Isaiah is going forward. And then came the time when King Uzziah dies. I'm sure for the people of Israel and Isaiah in particular, the impact was devastating. The one who built armies, who led battles, who provided food and security for 52 years was gone. For many of them, King Uzziah was the only king that they had ever known. How many of you know that the nation of Israel as a result of the death of the king, was a bit unstable, a bit shook up. I'm sure there were concerns about whether they would survive as a nation. I'm sure they wondered if their armies would now begin to weaken now that their king was dead, if our farmers would stop producing, if our wells would start to dry up. All of the things that Israel had grown so used to and probably had taken for granted for all those years, we're now coming into question how easy it must have been to focus one's hopes and trust on a king like Uzziah. How secure the people of God must have felt. But what happens when that king dies? No wonder the death of the king was so significant because it represented a time of prosperity and safety and peace. Prior to his death, everyone was, everything was so safe, so predictable, so certain, so convenient. And then this perceived source of the safety that they experienced through this king, he dies. The face of their security blanket is gone. 
Could you imagine what that must have been like? But it doesn't end there. Thank the Lord that this was just the beginning of the story for Isaiah and for the nation of Israel. Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. When everything seemed to look like it was going to fall apart, I saw the Lord. When the security of the nation was in question, I saw the Lord. When we were in fear of what the next stage was going to mean for us, I saw the Lord. When all that was at one time familiar has now changed, Isaiah says, I, I saw the Lord. Notice what happens. What could have been a season of, of tremendous stress and pain and setback for Isaiah was the very thing that catapulted him into this next season of ministry in his life. Look with me again at the text. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. In the train of his robe, it filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. John had a picture of this in Revelation, this same scene of the seraphim going back and forth, declaring the awesomeness and worthiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We see it in Revelation. Isaiah is seeing it in this vision. It says, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And Isaiah said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw Jesus. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal and he had taken with tong that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sins are atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. What an incredible vision that Isaiah has. Isaiah experiences a change in his life. It's a new day. It's a new season, a, a new year. Everything that was familiar from the past is now changing. And it causes Isaiah to experience God in a new and very powerful way. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. When everything changed for Isaiah, he saw the Lord. He worshiped God. Look what he said. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. When everything changed, I saw God. And before I tie this to our vision, let me just say that there are seasons in our life where we put our, our, our expectations, our security, all of our priorities on things, on people, on resources, on retirements, on religion, on hopes, on dreams. And there are times where that thing that we're holding on to is shattered. Maybe all of our security was on a person and they died. Or a 401k and it tanked. Too many times, we, 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 it was in, it's in those times where we put all of our trust, all of our security in things that are only temporary. You see, King Uzziah was only temporary. And, and Isaiah says, it was in the year that the temporary king died that I saw the king, 
high and lifted up. He was sitting on a throne. And, you know, there are times that I've learned that God will take that thing that we have put our trust in, the thing that we drive our security from, that thing that we put all of our hopes and dreams in, those temporary things. God will at times remove those, even allow them to die to show that he is the only one worthy of having all of our trust, all of our hope. He is the only one that can finish or, or that can carry us across the finish line. I remember in 2018 when my dad died. My dad was my biggest fan. He'd always come in and encourage me and challenge me and speak life into me as well as bring correction when I needed to hear it. And when it seemed like nobody ever understood me, my dad understood me. And then my dad died. And I was hard. And I remembered thinking, who's going to replace my dad? But you know what? God did something different in my heart. I changed as a result of that. I grew in a, in, as a result of that. I matured as a Christian and as a man and as a pastor as a result of God removing that significant person in my life, my trust and my allegiance and all of my, uh, my, my emotional trust was directed on my heavenly father. I want to encourage you today that it's in the death of your Uzziah that the birth of something new will enter into your life. Maybe you're holding on to something that isn't worthy of holding on to. Your retirement's not going to be enough. Your health is not going to be enough. Your relationships are not going to be enough. All of these things are only temporary. They are fleeting. The only one that is worthy of holding on is he who holds eternity in the very palm of his hands. And God in his mercy will even allow uh, disruption to come into our lives so that we might adjust our priorities and allegiance to the very creator of the universe. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. You know, as a church, we too are in in an exciting season of change. As we're entering into our 17th year of ministry, we're looking at everything differently. How we lead, how we govern, how we minister, how we shepherd, how we conduct outreach, how we disciple. Everything's on the table as we enter into the 17th year. We're looking and saying, God, we want to be more effective. I'm excited at the end of the service, we'll be installing Joshua as as one of our pastors here at Integrity Church, a a next generation of leadership that'll come into our church and make us better. You see, what brought us to today will not get us to tomorrow. What worked for us in the first five years of being a church plant isn't going to carry us into the next 10, 15 years. Now, I'm not talking about changing our doctrine. Those are not things that are up for negotiation, right? The word of God is what tells us what to believe and, and how to believe it. But I'm talking about changing our culture. I'm talking about re, re, recommitting ourselves to the, our priorities of, of reaching up and reaching out and reaching in. Because can I tell you that what that looked like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, is going to look very different now and in the next 15, 20 years if Jesus tarries. Reaching up and reaching out and reaching in, each reach represents a significant leg of a three-legged stool. Think of a three-legged stool. And while we grow, and while we develop, and while we mature into what God has designed for us to be, we want to ensure that each reach of our stool is growing in equal and healthy proportion to one another. You ever sit on an unbalanced stool? That's so frustrating, right? And you know what? It's really unsafe, too. And so as pastors and as elders, as leaders, we're looking and saying, As we're getting into a new year, let's put it all on the table. Let's talk about what reaching up and reaching out and reaching in looks like in these next number of years. For Isaiah, it was in the midst of a very unpredictable time, a time of loss, a time of grieving, a time of change that that he saw the Lord. It's there that he worshiped God. 
He got his eyes off of himself and onto the Lord. He got his eyes off of Uzziah and onto the Lord. That's what worship is. It's looking at God and his creation and saying, wow, look how awesome he is. Look how wonderful he is. Look how majestic he is. Look how small we are in comparison to the vastness of his awesome. Worship comes from a Latin word that ascribes worth to something. And there's nothing more worthy of our focus than Christ himself. We want to be a people who are reaching up in dynamic and passionate worship to God. Too many times we, we let the wrong things grab our attention, don't we? We can wrongly set our priorities on our job or our finances or our children or our finances or our careers or indeed ourselves. Can I tell you that in the church, sometimes we get it all mixed up thinking that our life is about us. Our life isn't about us. We exist for the glory of God. Everything we do is for the glory of God. That doesn't mean you can't have hopes and dreams and plans for the future, but we need to see those things through the lens of them being an expression of worship to God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the scripture says all these things will be given to you. God has blessings and goodness and good times for his people, but they ought to flow out of lives that have Christ as the center point of worship. It's seeing everything through the lens of God's awesomeness and saying, wow, God is good. What is more important than that? What has more eternal value than Christ and our relationship with God? To reach up in dynamic and passionate worship to God is to keep Christ front and center of all that we do. It doesn't mean that we disconnect from life or our job or our families and become weird. We've seen them. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about living a full and vibrant life out of expression and love for God prioritizing your relationship with him, reaching up in dynamic and passionate worship to God. This is what causes us to reach up. That's what Isaiah was doing. He's reaching up. He's saying, wow, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And that reaching up caused him then to look inward, to take personal inventory of his own heart, of his own ways, and of his own context. Isaiah literally goes from wow to whoa. Look at verse 5. And he said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice the transition. Listen, it wasn't like Isaiah was coming out of a sinful lifestyle at that point. In fact, this wasn't even the inauguration into ministry. He was already in the ministry. But his awareness of the awesomeness of God made him realize his need for God. The pro a proper view of God ought to raise our awareness of our need for God and our need for one another. Here's the problem with today. The problem today is everybody compares themselves to other people. You see, and, and the problem is this. If you think you get to heaven by being just a good person, then all you need to do is go, fall, go find some really bad people, compare yourself to them, and feel pretty good about yourself right? Say, I, I might be a good person. I might be a bad person. It depends on who I'm comparing myself to. The problem is the scripture doesn't teach us to compare ourselves to anybody other than Christ alone. And so what's the standard? The standard is perfection. That's the standard. 
You see, man doesn't want to see himself as a sinner in need of a savior. But the reality of it is every person born of Adam is born in sin and in need of a savior. That's why God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It wasn't an invitation to join a church or a religion. It was an invitation to find to find reconciliation between creator and creation, to find forgiveness so that that standard would be held up. And here's Isaiah, and he has a fresh glimpse of God. And he realizes his need. His upward look caused him to take an inward look, and he says, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. I know in my times of, of awareness of God's presence, in those times where, where it seems like God's presence is most manifest, I become so much more aware of areas in my life that are in not, not consistent with what God's called me to. And it's in those moments that I, I repent of those things. I ask God's forgiveness for those things. You can't look at the radiance of God and not see the darkness of the world around us. And it's when the Holy Spirit highlights those areas in our lives that are inconsistent with what God has for us that we're invited to repent of those things and find forgiveness in Christ. That's what happened. That's really what happened with Isaiah. He says, look, he said he he moved from wow to whoa, right? God, you're perfect. I'm not. I know what's in my heart. I know my attitudes. I know my ways. And he was aware, and he says, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And look what happens, verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, and that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. You see, reaching in through intentional discipleship and the study of God's word, it's what shines light in the dark places of our hearts that we need to turn from so that we might walk in what God has for us. The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we enter into 2023, we want to be reaching in through intentional discipleship and the study of God's word. As we enter into the new year, we want to get a fresh view of God through worship a fresh view of ourselves through discipleship and the study of God's word. And then we want to get a fresh view of the needs around us. Reaching out with a message of hope that is found in Christ alone. That's the direction that this scene brings Isaiah to. Michelle, I so much appreciated what we, Michelle highlighted to me afterwards in service. I love it. We, we, we see Isaiah going from, from wow to woe, now to go. Watch what happens here. Look, it says in verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. The vision that Isaiah has catapults him into a new season of ministry that God had for him. It moved him from wow to woe to go. It moved him from being in the presence, it being a presence in the sanctuary, to being a prophet in the nation, which ties back to our ultimate mission as a church, to go and make disciples. To not just be a, a club that we come to on Sunday morning, hear a couple of good things, have a good bagel and coffee, connect once or twice during the week, and not move outside the four walls and do what ultimately we're called to do, which is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To point people to the life-changing message of the cross of Christ, of forgiveness of sins, and reconciliation between creator and creation through the work of Christ on the cross. There's no greater message than the gospel of Jesus. There's no better news that man can find forgiveness in Christ. There's no greater message, there's no greater mission that we can go on. Think of it. What has more significant eternal value 
than being on mission for God. There's no greater message, there's no greater mission, and there's no greater mediator than Christ himself. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the most important message that humanity can embrace and apply to their lives. And so we seek to be a church that is reaching up in dynamic and passionate worship, reaching out to the unchurched with the message of hope that is found in Christ alone, and then reaching in through intentional discipleship and the study of God's word. It's where we're going. It's who we are. And there's no greater priority that we can have as followers of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, would you just instill in our hearts this passion, this, this desire, this discipline of reaching up and reaching out and reaching in, Lord, would you help us to, to, to put our life and our priorities in their proper place so that we might be an expression of what you've called for us to be as your disciples of Jesus in the world in which you've called us to. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.